Okay. Today we've gone to the third part of our study of SD48.1. It is on karma, <coughs> karma in the afterlife. Today's uh, reflection is recorded in my study because we couldn't make it to the center because of, of the public train failure, public train breakdown. So here we are in this study where the ST translation is done. Now today the theme is the 49 days of the dead and their significance. In the East, they, whenever there is a death, the 49 days are very well known and uh, very significant and people often want to know about them. Now, uh, the first thing we must know in early Buddhism at least, when, whenever we talk about numbers, they either refer to sets of teachings or otherwise they normally refer to something symbolic. The number 49, for example, is 7 times 7. And uh, <clears throat> we also know of the Buddha's uh, uh, the days of the Buddha after he was awakened, after the Great Awakening, he spent seven weeks doing different kinds of meditation. So again, there we have 49 days. Um, of course, in, in, in that case, the 49 days are kind of uh, quite clear, quite finite, the actual 49 the number 49, referring to 49 days, 7 weeks. Then we have, uh, in the case of the streaminess, 7 more lives to go. I have asked many monks, learned monks, practicing monks, and the, the, the standard answer is that it's probably a symbolic number, meaning not too many more lives. Because uh, when we talk about the seven lives of a stream winner, for example, you find if the stream winner is reborn in, in one of those higher realms, and the Brahma realms, the lifespan there may last as long as the whole world cycle. So it's, if we talk about seven lives with that kind of lifespan, it can be very long. But then again, the lives of the stream winner need not be seven, it could be less, you could become, you could awaken as a, an arahat in the ne next life or three more lives or five more lives even, but definitely not more than seven lives. So here we are, we have a good idea when we talk about the 49 days, it can be symbolic too. Uh, but of course, in, for the Biri family, for the mourning family, the observances can be 7 times 7, in other words, they can if they want, if they can afford to, if, if they are inclined to, to do special, meaningful meditation, prayers, every 7 days, or definitely on the 49th day. And of course, the, the local Buddhists, especially the Chinese, also observe, observe very significant 100 days. So these are days of mourning, days of recollecting uh, the deceased. Now, a very important thing for us to understand is that uh, once a person dies, according to the teachings of the historical Buddha, the person is reborn. So in that, in that sense, uh, there is no death in the conventional way of thinking. The body ceases to function, the body uh, runs out of day, as we say in Singapore. So <clears throat> the consciousness moves on to find a suitable new body and to continue its existence in a new life. The question now is uh, how did this notion, how did this idea of the 49 days uh, arise? Um, now, we, we can say that, uh, but before that, that, there is another interesting view which the, some Buddhists even today have. That is a small group of, of uh, 
people, they believe that rebirth is immediate, especially those who follow the Abedama tradition. There are lots of problems here. We say rebirth is immediate. For example, according to the Abhidharma tradition, attaining of streaming and the various stages of sainthood are all immediate. Uh, this is the theory of moments. Now, if we understand or we think of this kind of situation, the saints attaining their stages of sainthood, the moment of death all immediate. We have quite a lot of problems. Uh, number one, we do not have any support in the suttas for this kind of idea. Number two, logically it's quite difficult to to picture this kind of situation. And number three, there are suttas uh, where offerings are given to monks and the sutta says uh, there are different kinds of uh, monks there in the Kitagiri sutta for example you have different kinds of saints the Srimuna, the Onesutana, non and so on and the donor serves food to these saints now if he does that logically those saints uh, they, they live through a duration they do not they do not become saints just for a moment so it's not logical to to say that the moment is uh, I mean it's just a moment that, that this saint takes to attain those levels of course we, we can uh, understand that uh, the saint the first uh, part of it the awake the, the part of realization may appear to be sudden so to speak Again, that's theoretical. It's just like, you know, we have a stretch of, uh, let's say, uh, 60 seconds, you know, the beginning of the first second. So it's kind of, it goes through a, a duration. So these are really technical stuff. They're not very useful. So it's more helpful, more realistic for us to just speak in normal language and say, well, they, they go through time. Uh, they take time to awaken and, and uh, people take time to die, the death, pro death process, the rebirth process takes time. Okay, so uh, that will make more sense. Uh, and also early Buddhism is in the habit of talking about the gradual process of awakening too. Uh, so uh, here is where when we talk about the dying process as a mental event from, from this side and the rebirth process from the other side, again, technically speaking, they, they may re refer to the same thing. And then again, in between this, uh, the current the, the death in this life and the rebirth in the next life, there may be an in-between state. So this is another interesting uh, idea and an interesting teaching. Uh, the hints of which are found in the suttas which I won't be going into, many of them are very technical and they're all listed very carefully in the Sutta Discovery series here. Today we, we only look at some of the interesting ideas regarding the 49 days. So how did this idea of uh, the person dying does so immediately? No such idea is found in the suttas. Apparently the, the first idea were, came to be known came to be recorded in the Melinda Panha, the questions of uh, King Melinda. Here again, uh, we have this idea where uh, Nagasena explains to the king that rebirth is immediate by comparing the shadow of two birds, the bird on the tree and the bird on the ground. So he asked the king the shadow of which bird touches the ground first and the king as well. It's obvious the bird of both shadows touch the ground at the same time, immediate. So the Nagasena says even so, rebirth takes place like that. Right. So that, that is, uh, uh, you might say, the later idea, the Abhidhamma idea, if you like, uh, which most informed Buddhists today uh, would not accept. So uh, we can leave that idea of immediate uh, rebirth aside and focus on the intermediate state on Tarabhava, which kind of explains rebirth more uh, 
in a way which is more easily under, understood. And uh, this is one idea, you might say, which is also found in the early Mahayana, in the works of Asubandhu and so on. And uh, you might say most Buddhists today, even in Southeast Asia, uh, accept this idea, this teaching of the 49 days. So, the when we talk about the 49 days, we, we're also talking, we're talking about this being uh, which is mind-made or who is mind-made going through this process of rebirth, if you like. And uh, what happens in the 49 days, if you like. So here again, this is uh, not an easy question to answer. What I'm saying is purely conjectural. Uh, it's it's uh, speculative, if you like. Uh, it gives us some idea what probably what is likely to happen. In other words, we have this consciousness, which uh, is a kind of an in-between state, antarabhava, and according to uh, Vasubandhu, it, it is the Gandhava, and a Gandhava, of course, is a term used in the Majjhima Nikaya too a being to be born or rebirth consciousness uh, and in later works in Abhidharma you have many terms for this for example Bawanga and so on so all these different terms is like a, a rich thesaurus of terms for this intermediate being and, and this makes a good sense because if someone were to die immediately it would not be easy for this person if he's awakened to find a new suitable rebirth However, we cannot discount the fact that immediate rebirth can occur in the case of, say, the Arahat. Of course, the Arahat passes away immediately, so we can kind of live out the case of the Arahat. But in the case of the non-returner, the once-returner, and, and, and the stream winner, these are saints with quite a peaceful minds. Their rebirth are likely to be immediate in the sense that their rebirth is always good in some happy place. So we can apply the teaching of immediate rebirth in their cases. However, in the case of the normal unawakened person, the average whirling, if you like, it is easier if we understand that they take time to be reborn. And here again, it is pro again. There was a time apparently when the, the thinkers and the teachers of, of Buddhism were not sure. In fact, if you do research, you find in the various ancient records and manuscripts and scraps that are discovered here and there, you you may see that there's a wide range of of the length of time of the duration. But generally, it's easier to speak of the 49 days. So here again. In, in the case of religion, as we say, some of this uh, length of time and, and even some of these teachings, they are kind of approximate. They, they are kind of teachings to help the bereaved, those who have lost some dear ones, accept the death. Right. So, so we can take 49 days as a kind of working number. And this uh, uh, intermediate being, uh, has left the body, so it's on its own, so to speak, and still... Yeah. So what fuels it, according again to the suttas, the Buddha says, it is craving, that's the fuel. So yeah, craving refers to past karma, the, the will to live, if you like. So this, uh, this craving pushes on this uh, intermediate being and is kind of stuck in this level in between still uncertain, undecided what to do, how to move on. So it doesn't belong to any of the six realms. Now, what's interesting is, uh, I mentioned six realms. Maybe we can say five realms, or five realms and a half perhaps. You have the five human realm plus the four lower realms, the human realm, then you have the animal realm, the Asura realm, the Preta realm, and the Hell realms. So there you have human and the four subhuman realms. Definitely in these cases, 
the intermediate state applies. Uh, in other words, these beings uh, are in the sense world, they may anytime fall into this uh, four or five states, human state or the four subhuman states. Uh, it is also possible that the intermediate being can be reborn in, in some deva world of the sense world. And, uh, but according to some little teachers like Master Bandhu, they, they say that it is that the intermediate beings is also possible to be reborn in the form world, but definitely not the formless world. I find this difficult to explain because uh, you need dhyana, you need jhana to be able to attain the form world. So it's not going to be very easy. And if, if anyone has jhana and he, he's very good in meditation, he will be reborn immediately anyway. So I think we need to exclude the form world, the Rupa Loka, from this the, the scheme of the intermediate state. The intermediate being is unlikely to be reborn in such a high state. So this intermediate being, in other words, will either be reborn in the lower Deva worlds or the sense world, in the human realm, or in the suffering states, the four lower states. Now the, the question now is asked, uh, can we help these beings? Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, Buddhist teachings are, well, let me be more specific. Early Buddhist teachings are very clear about how we should deal with the dead. And the basic idea is there must be metta, there must be loving kindness. If someone in our family dies, someone close to us, someone dear to us passes away, the first thing we must do is get into a calm state and send our thoughts of loving kindness to this person. We picture that this person probably may be still hovering around us because he's so, he or she is so close to us, so it's more like very likely to kind of uh, try to be with us or be in the places that uh, this person is familiar with. And we send this loving kindness, we exude, emanate this loving kindness to feel the environment hoping that this loving kindness will touch this person who is caught in the intermediate state. So that according to Thirukuda Sutta, this person, in this case a Preta, here again we have some scholars who uh, equate the, some teachers who equate the intermediate state with the Preta, because the word Preta or Peta means one who has departed, passed beyond. So all we can we just uh, we can omit the idea of the preta even for a while. Just take this being as simply in the intermediate state and kind of uh, uncertain, okay, in limbo, if you like. Uh, so when we cultivate loving kindness, this being feels happy. This being uh, can sense. It's like they can see us, but they can't communicate. The other senses are not working, so to speak. They're able. To, it's like a disembodied uh, vision, like like a kind of camera far away watching, and that's about it. You can talk. Uh, you, you can sense the loving kindness. So according to the Tirukkuda Sutta, these pratas they kind of they experience this this joy, this goodness, this kind thoughts we show to them. And that inspires kind thoughts in them. It's like as if, let's say, uh, if I'm the, the intermediate being or the, or the preta kind of wandering around looking for some solace and succor, so I see someone, my, those I knew well, those who have loved me, those whom I've loved, remembering me and, and kind of saying some good things about me with their loving kindness, or they, they send out this really good feeling of loving kindness, then I feel good too, and a preta is not able to do that on, on his own, uh, and I suppose the intermediate being also is not able to do that on his own. So it's like someone very depressed, and you go to this person and you bring this person to a bright place, and you say nice things to this person, brings back, bring back happy memories to this person, and this person is here, it feels good. So the preta is like that, it feels happy when you send out your loving kindness and once they're able to generate that sort of uh, mental state they fall from that state and they're reborn 
hopefully in happier states. So again, here is where, as I stress, loving kindness is very important. This means we should not merely employ professional mourners and have noisy rituals where the family doesn't participate and, and worse we, we just want to get it all over quickly and, and that's terrible we should not be doing that uh, in other words if, our f if someone we love has passed there you should gather together and say goodbye to this person as a gesture of love a final gesture of love and that's the proper thing to do we deal with our babies when they come into this world, we should send them away lovingly too when they pass away. And that's a grand Buddhist way to go. So, and all done with loving kindness. So, the, the popular culture of noisy rituals and, and uh, elaborate showing of, of uh, external uh, sadness and so on, it's not very helpful. On the other hand, if we gather together and we say our eulogies, our happy memories of this one who has passed away, or even play the music that he's used to, or put beautiful flowers around his coffin or body, things like that, something meaningful that we can do for this the remains of this person, that would be really significant and good. So, the point here therefore is uh, it's the thought that counts, it's the loving kindness that counts. Always remember in, in my whole talk today the importance of loving kindness when we deal with the dying and the departed. Remember, there's no departed, they are perhaps going through a process of finding a new birth, or maybe they already reborn, then, then we don't have to really worry about them. Well, of course, we can still remember them with loving kindness. And uh, when we do perform acts of marriage, offering dana to worthy monks and nuns and so on, again, we dedicate this marriage to them. We do not transfer it. Marriage cannot be transferred. We dedicate it. And that way, Again, the operating power here is loving-kindness. So all this must be done with loving-kindness, then only the marriage would be effective on the deceased. So having said that, I'm sure uh, we are quite clear that the early Buddhist approach to the disease is a very humane one, it's a very friendly one. It's one filled with loving-kindness. We care for the dying as we with loving kindness as we do for the living and we send our loving kindness to them too when they have moved on and that's how we should treat the our understanding of the teaching of the 49 days and now let us do a short reflection to close this uh, study the buddha in his wisdom teaches us ways of dealing with difficult moments and faces in our life so that we learn valuable lessons from such uh, events whether a child is born or, or, or a birthday or a wedding or some significant event like housewarming and of course finally the person passing away and their death anniversaries these are highlights in our life when we should welcome the Dharma into our life and reflect on the teachings of, of wisdom and liberation and humanity. Reflecting in this way is wonderful good karma, but the power of such good karma may we be empowered with courage and wisdom to aspire to attain stream winning in this life itself at least. By the same token, by the power of the three jewels, let us send out our loving kindness to all those whom we love, all those who care for us, those who have supported us, and those who are teaching the Dhamma and practicing the Dhamma. May they be well and happy. And also let us send out our loving kindness to all those who have difficulties with the teachings who are lost in seeking the true teaching. May they see the 
the truth of the Dharma in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.